Hello, everyone. Um, I'm so happy to be here in Amsterdam in this wonderful venue, and very welcome to have you guys today. Uh, my name is Flavio Duro. Uh, I've been working uh, as a software engineer for a decade, uh, worked in a lot of banks. I've seen the good, the bad, the ugly, and I'm currently uh, a staff engineer at Solaris Bank, where I work with core baking systems. So who's excited to talk about mainframes? <laughs> We're not talking about that today. A little bit about Solaris Bank. So we have a bank in the name, but at heart, we are a tech company. Um, some years ago, we've realized that if uh, someone wants to offer financial services to their customers, they have basically two options. They can become a bank or integrate with an existing one. And usually, integrating means going through all the interfaces and uh, very old software, and they have all these contracts, and it's, it's not so easy. And we thought that we could make it easier, and we wanted to make a frictionless experience where banking services can be offered through REST APIs with uh, easy integration. And today, uh, six years later, we are a Europe market leader. We are from uh, originally Berlin, Germany, but we operate in eight markets. Uh, we have more than 5 million uh, customer accounts and over 400 APIs. Uh, some of our customers you can see here, so uh, Samsung Pay, for, for instance, in Europe, uh, works with Solaris Bank as the back end, as the real bank that does the actual banking operations. And on top of that, uh, our partners can build a layer for all the product that they want to integrate, be it a tech company, a fintech. And more and more, we are realizing the potential of this concept where existing established banks are actually six for us so that they can use our APIs and enable new services. So the layers that we have is really decomposed in three parts. The partners platform are the SDKs, web UI, that the different companies that use our services integrate and put directly alongside their platform. Then in the middle part really comes the banking APIs, which are the products that we offer. KYC, payments, cards, lending, and all the regulatory and back office that are necessary for a bank in Europe to operate within the regulation of the central banks. And on the lower part comes the dirty part. <laughs> it's the core platform. This is all the primitive banking operations holding people's money in databases and operating with all the payment networks all over the world to send and exchange money. So, how do we do this? Today, we're going to talk about core banking and how we've designed core banking at Solaris Bank from the beginning to the mistakes to the success. Who knows about core banking here? I've, I've seen a lot of people from... Ooh, yeah, I see people raising hands in shame, but don't be. Uh, core banking is absolutely fantastic. We have a long history of innovation. Uh, banks in the 70s were already uh, networked operation in an industry where uh, everyone was doing business over paper and phone. Banks already had network cables connecting all the different branches and centralizing data in files, which I can only be described as a database back in the 70s. And then they've involved mainframes is a derivative of an hard, a hardware engineering branch that could perform thousands of transactions per second in the 80s. It's, it's not a shameful word. We all have these ideas that it is stuck software, but this piece of engineering absolutely marvelous and enable decades of innovation led by investment in banks. In the 90s, I'm French. We had this device called the Minitel. It was a small box that you could put in your home, plug in the telephone line, and it had a screen. You could input some digits, which were like URLs. That was really in the eight, late 80s. And you could uh, have a chat with some friend that also had a Minitel, or you could uh, consult some information. In 1987, the first banks in France started integrating with the Minitel so that people could check, check that their balances online. So really, there are no shame that uh, banks I've been innovating for the past 50 years. It is true that nowadays banks are struggling to adapt. New players on the market are arriving, they'll build brand new software, and they're adapting to the needs of the modern customers. And I'm here to make the case that banking as a service is just a natural evolution from 50 years of innovation in banking. 
don't take my word for it, this is what we had up until now. I mean, I'm taking the worst example of it, but this is Hello World in IBM COBOL, which I hope nobody of you have ever worked with, but this was supposed to be the uh, peak enterprise uh, software for core banking systems, even worse to me than COBOL, which I've read quite a few, but uh, I think we came to realize that this leads absolutely nowhere. You cannot get any job done with that kind of environment, and that's why we really had to rethink uh, how we want to build all these programs. But the job is not easy because we have the existing software. Large banks have tens of thousands of such programs which are slightly more productive than this one. And how do you maintain that? Uh, I've, I've taken this excerpt from a talk I've seen uh, called The Worst Programming Language in the World, which takes a little bit of the worst of every language, but can't, can't get worse than that. So how do we do it? Solaris Bank was born six, seven years ago, and uh, we set ourselves to achieve this goal, building shiny APIs and make it easy for everyone to do banking. So we said, let's do an MVP, right? In a startup economics, you cannot take seven years to make a product. You have to do it in a year. You have to time the market, and you need to get the product roll out. You don't have a choice. So how do you do a bank? Well, uh, you start with KYC, retail accounts, and business accounts. You cannot live without that, right? Because that's what you're going to sell. You need to prove that the clients exist and are who they claim to be, and you need to hold the deposits into regulated accounts. Then they'll need to pay their bills. So you need direct debits, probably check their balance, and integrate with the regular payment networks that you cannot work without. All right, starting to be a little bit of things to build for MVP, but let's go in it. Regulation dictates that you need anti-money laundering software, fraud monitoring, and a compliance engine to be sure that all of this is working well regulated and checking for all the sanction lists and so on and so forth. We're done yet? Nope. We actually need cards. No customer want to onboard in a bank if you don't have cards. So and card is connected with existing Visa and MasterCard integrations, issuing and the logistic of delivering the actual plastic, but you also need limits, you also need expiration of the cards, you need withdrawal, so you, you actually need to interact with the ATMs. Uh, then comes the loan part. So, <laughs> if you want to make a profit, you will actually be offering credit, but to do that, you'll need to set installments, loan onboarding, interest calculation, credit scoring, and then you need to go with all the national credit systems so that you're actually regulated for that, put all of this in general ledger, then a treasury bill, tax reporting, back office theorem. Oh my God, where this is going? Uh, so this MVP really is a massive vanity project because we thought we would change that, but how do we change that? So the solution is to not build it. And that's what we did. Building a bank from scratch was actually building the value part of the bank from scratch and using things that we could that already existed. This is the only way to do it in a year. So we received a banking license after less than a year, record time by the Bundesbank in Germany. We become a principal membership with MasterCard so that we have these products that the customer cannot live without. And we start onboarding customers. This in a span of a year, record time. So what's the catch? Well, this is the catch. This is an excerpt from an architecture diagram, which I'm not proud of. Uh, we have created the mother of all monolith, a wrapper around a core banking system that we purchased. And basically, the hourring system kind of show you that every single entity in the company was calling uh, some feature of this core banking system, from finance to digital banking to authentication. Everything was connected to this. So if you mess up a deployment, the entire bank goes down. If you have a performance issue, everybody complains. And of course, because we bought the system and built a layer on top and probably a layer around the layer, things get more complex to change. You don't really know how to work with it. And trust me, we've tried to optimize it. We've built cache layers. We synchronized. You can see in the Redis, we had a cache system just for the bookings, the mirroring database. But at just at some point, this cannot work. But the customer were coming in, and the company was growing. So as time moved, out, moved by, we've seen that uh, the, this is fine, I guess. Like, we had really, like, are we the baddies moment where we think that we're actually uh, speed running uh, 30 years of mistakes in banking software. And the performance ain't much better. So uh, 
if you work in fintechs of banking, you know that spiky loads is extremely present. You have the central bank windows, you have uh, all the customers waking up and want to check how many mo much money they have, and you have the business accounts, of course, who will batch all their payments in the same day of the month, and you have to live with this. And we can't see much on this Grafana archive, which I found like very hidden in <laughs> when I was preparing for this talk, but basically, things could take hours to synchronize, like the bookings were not coming in, and then the clients would call what's happening with the system, and there just aren't a way to hide this. An engineer in 2017 was observing that it could take between 10 seconds and 30 minutes to book an SCT. Nice estimate. And of course, nobody wants to work with a system that uh, performs a transaction in 30 minutes. Even the CPO, and I've redacted some parts, said we need to take precautionary measure to prevent the core banking system from collapsing. So the CPO was already well aware that its whole product layer was on the brink of collapse if we didn't do something. So we did what no bank should ever, ever, ever do. We decided to throw everything into the trash and redo it. Because the lesson is that you cannot optimize your way out of a bad design. So banking is a world with constraints, and I think a lot of you have already read, so you know what I'm talking about. Uh, we have SLAs that are very strict and controlled. You need frequent patches, not just for security, but also regulatory, SEPA rule book. You know what I'm talking about. But you need to be cost efficient, because you're serving this for millions and millions of customers. So the, the economics is really on the unit uh, spent per customer. And it needs to be scalable, because as a young company, you really strive to scale. Those are the invariants uh, in our tech stack. We have chosen to completely depart from the world before us, and we have made event sourcing really the bread and butter of our architecture. I'll go more into that and why I think this is the best architecture possible for a banking system or a core banking system. We have a fleet, as, as the time of this uh, talk, 93 microservices all running in Golang just to serve the core banking system. We think that Go has the perfect tool set to offer with a low memory footprint and high concurrency models, and it really has served really well. They all run in Kubernetes so that we can have easy and fast deployments and availability built in. This system was the first one at Solaris Bank that was entirely born in AWS, and it has showed the way for the entire company to follow suit, and now all Solaris Bank runs in AWS. And the data stores, which for core banking are essential, uh, we have chosen DynamoDB for event sourcing and PostgreSQL to hold all the snapshots of the customer data. Now, event sourcing. If you don't know, event sourcing is an architecture where every single change that you make in your system is captured through a sequence of events. That means that you will separate every right operations on your system and encapsulate them with a first entry point. In this case, we want to perform a transfer, a bank transfer. We have this transfer command that will receive the HTTP request, and it will immediately write into the event store that we have initiated that transfer. Uh, of course, after checking if the customer has enough balance, if the account is not closed, and all the necessary checks. When this is done, we send a signal to SNS, which is the messaging system, on a notification system on AWS. A queue will pull from this message and transmit to a worker that he has job to do. The AML worker will check the sanction list, the under monitoring list to make sure that no one is trying to launder money or funnel this transfer to a terrorist. And then each step of the way will write new events in a sequence. This gives you native logging of everything that had happened with the transfer. There is no more transparent way to display bank information than this sequence of events until it is finalized and can be exported to a central bank, if we're talking about external or different payment gateways. Now, how do you figure out what is the state of the transfer, right? Because it has so many different steps and people will want to consult. The customer itself would like to know what's happening with his transfer. So each step will produce an individual JSON payload that we will store inside the event store. This is tracked with a single ID that we call the aggregated ID and has a payload with the actual banking 
data, the business data, which in this case would be the amount that we display with uh, 500. Of course, we uh, store all the monetary values as integers so that we don't have to deal with floating points, um, which can be a problem if you work with Korean currency, by the way, Alan, because there is no sense. But a uh, story for another talk. Uh, then each service that will pick up these messages will increment and enrich the data by providing if the checks were passed and where the destination is going and what's the current state and so on and so forth. So at the end, you get this sequence of events that are all visible and trackable by this single aggregate idea and you can figure out what happened and what's the current state. As a rule, and except force majeure, we force happened only immutable events and not commutative. That means that the order in which the events are written actually matters. And that's challenges to which we have to adapt our architecture for. But it also gives us the additional security that nobody will change history. Nobody will insert corrupted data. So this, this works really well with, with, with our pattern. To take full benefit of this, we use CQRS in which the commands on one part are the right operations, but they go through a secondary uh, way where we have what we call a projection, a service that listens to each and every event and aggregates the last state and put it in a relational database that is easy to query. If back office needs to know how many uh, transfers for more than one million euros happen in the morning, well, they can. We have built a schema that is optimized exactly for that purpose. They do not need to go through all the events in the event store. And this is very flexible because we can build many snapshots with different purposes and with schema that are optimized. The craziness that we have actually built the ledger with the same concept. The ledger is just a projection of the events. If you, if you want, you could rebuild the ledger. I could delete the ledger in production right now. I won't do it, but I could. And we could go through all the events history and reproject it into the ledger as it is exactly right now. I take all these different events, uh, foreign exchange, ADM, car transactions. All of these are events. They are different actions that our customer can write, can request in our system. And all of this will be captured by the ledger projection and be reflected into the double entry the accounting method uh, data structure that we use to represent money, that represent the actual money in the bank accounts. How does this work? Exactly like a regular projection. The ledger projection will fetch all of these events that represent money movements and will write in dedicated table in the database the entirety of the bookings and what is the current balance. Challenges with double entry is that um, they always have two entries. You have the credit and the debit. Uh, if I am sending money to you, then I am the debtor and you are the creditor. And this means that uh, the sum of all the entries is a zero-sum game. If I sum all the bookings in the ledger, I will get zero. And if I sum all the bookings with my IBAN, I will get my balance. So this is how we build the ledger, and all of this is derived from the events where you get the amount for each uh, customer. Now, all of this is really good, but it comes with a cost. So I put my mandatory Martin Fuller quote here, that distributed software has a much major disadvantage, and we have to work with the disadvantages of distributed software. We have 93 microservices, multiple database, and we have to interconnect all the sparks. So what are the trade-offs? So first is eventual consistency. And in banking, it's a big world because uh, we are under constant fire of cyber attacks, fraudsters, people trying to take advantage of the system to steal money. And we know this firsthand. We have to prevent and we have to plan for every possible scenario. So there are things that we can make eventually consistent, and there are things that we absolutely cannot. Transfers is somewhat asynchronous because you will be dependent on the payment networks to execute them. You will be dependent on central bank windows, so this can be uh, asynchronous. With a caveat that your customer expects the bookings to come as fast as possible on his actual statement, nobody wants to wait uh, one minute or two minutes to see if the transfer worked or not. You will lose the customer trust, so that's why we have SLOs. 
imports, direct debits, overdraft, and any schedule action can also be highly eventual consistent. But we, as a rule, try to make all the projections happen in less than a second. There are things that cannot be eventually, uh, eventually consistent. Uh, account blocks or account closures must be directly fetched from the events. We do what we call a projection at runtime. That means that we will fetch the events, aggregate the state, and get the result. It is slightly slower, but in the case where you cannot be eventually consistent, that's what you do. Another example that is very typical is transfer authorization. If I was checking an eventually consistent balance to authorize a payment, then someone very smart could make 100 payments at the same time, and then it would always check against the first balance. That cannot happen in this system. We always would have uh, the latest balance, which would take into account the previous attempts. Now, asynchronous software have other uh, problems, which are more about the product. How do you convey to the businesses that rely on you that uh, the data can be eventually consistent and that the final state can, come ar uh, can arrive after you have answered them to 200? If they call a credit transfer and we answer 200 to them, they have to know what that means. And for us, it means the transfer was initiated. It was not completed, it was initiated. So we think with a high amount of trust that we have all the necessary information through the payload to process the payment. Then it goes through all the sequence that I've explained before, and finally it can be finalized. Of course, in a very low percentage um, of uh, the time, you can have an AML hit. We could have a match of the name of this person against the list that obliges us as a regulated industry to block this payment and analyze it before processing it. And how do we, we, we try to give constant feedback through SNS notification and webhooks so that our customers can know at all time everything that is happening, everything that's changed. So in the end, they just have to wait for the correct signal. We can give them a signal, well, this was initiated. And then they will wait for a signal that tells you it that it's completed, put a little push on the application so that the customer can know that everything happened correctly. In a chain of event, one of your system can misbehave. It's a double-edged sword because in one hand, we are very happy that our command can still answer 200 and we keep accepting payments. In the eye of the customers, everything's going fine. But if you have some asynchronous part is breaking, then your queue starts to grow and you will get nothing processed. So we do retry 10 times, and eventually, if a payment cannot be processed, it will go into a dead letter queue where it will be waiting for a fix to happen of someone to intervene. But that enables to unblock the queue and continue processing the payments that we can actually process. We have built a special piece of software called the supervisor, which actually tracks every single payment in the system and find out if they are being processed as planned. It is timing, it allows for a certain amount of time for a payment to be processed, and if we are past that, then our observability stack will catch up this and probably create an incident or uh, call up an on-call engineer and so someone can actually take a look and fix the problem. I won't go much into the ops, uh, ops and infrastructure part. I think it's 2022, uh, but here I can just um, say once again, I've heard many times uh, in this conference that uh, the cloud forces you to make good practices, and this is no exception. We've fully utilized AWS. Uh, every services of ours have multiple replicas, and uh, we can horizontally scale every part of the system if in the morning, we have more payment to process because the central bank has imported uh, big files, then we can scale up a lot all the importing payment part. And if we are in the late afternoon and everyone wants to see its bank accounts, then we will just scale up the query balance part. We distribute the load on different availability zones. Uh, last year, in June, uh, AWS had an outage uh, in the zone C of Frankfurt, which is the region that we, we use for uh, our system, and luckily it was mostly invisible because we could relocate the load into the other AZ that we had already set up. And Kubernetes allows us to deploy easily multiple times a day. We have a CI pipeline that enables to test and deploy 
Uh, I say multiple times a day, but it's always small units of deployments because we have 93 microservices. So that also means that when a deployment fails, a very subset of the system has to be worked with. All of this is version, it can get rollbacked, and mostly work. And from infrastructure to business logic, everything is represented at a code so that we can track every change. And in banking, it gives us this additional insurance that no faulty code can be pushed, or worse, no malicious code can be pushed. So that's all nice and good, but remember what I had before, like this big monolith thing? Well, it had plenty of customers. We had already uh, going to one million banking account and uh, multiple <laughs> uh, millions of transfers happening every day. So the question is really, how do you go from one to another? People used to uh, say that uh, maintaining software is like refueling a plane when it's flying. Well, migrating legacy system is basically changing the passenger from one plane to another. And this is not an easy task, especially when you have all the dependencies and all these teams depending on the feature of the original system. So let's make a plan. In 2018, we said that we wanted in three years to migrate everyone to the new system. We had no code done, and we had just a team of a few people that had this dream and started going. Blueprints, architecture, how do we solve this problem and this problem? And we set the goal and moving parts. They identified that one of the first domains that they could migrate successfully was the accounts domain, which registers the IBANs and the holders of the bank accounts. So we started with that. We built that part of the service, and we replicated with the legacy system all the data back and forth so that all the queries could be made on the new system while simultaneously allowing all the payments to still happen in the old one. Then, one year later, we worked through the first SCT with production data with the central bank. The green light by the central bank that the new system was capable of doing this was celebrated as a sign of hope that this could actually happen. This was crazy, but this could actually happen. We had then a beta test, friends and families expanding the circle, and then we decided that all new business should be created immediately on the new system without relying. We used a new BIC, a new BIC, so that we had like a digital branch on the old one and a digital branch on, on the new one. And then in Q4 2020, we reached out to everyone and said, guys, dear customers, we are going through with this. We are going through the migration. We will use a new core banking system, and we're going to migrate all the data of your dear end customers. And we will try to make it without you noticing. Of course, things don't always go up <laughs> to what we plan, but um, that, that was the goal. And in Q2 2021, in June of last year, I think it's, we have celebrated the one-year anniversary last week, uh, we migrated all the customer to the new platform. The challenges with such a migration are that the structure of data is very different. On one side, you have events that you write in DynamoDB, and on another one, I had some SQL Server database, I believe, uh, with some very, very ugly schema design. And it makes no sense for me to replicate the idiotic schema design that was done for the first one. If, so you really need to have a transformation layer that can translate between the two systems. We basically have a 0% consistency failure. That means that if a balance doesn't match and a customer wakes up another day with the wrong balance, it's just we open the door for lawsuits and possibly losing the banking license. So that's not what we want. We said that we wanted no downtime, but that's an ideally. Uh, <laughs> I'll go into that later. Uh, we obviously need feature parity because you cannot possibly offer less features to your customers. If you migrate them to the new system, they expect to have the same or more. Uh, we had this strict deadline. That's because of licensing and that's because in such a migration, you have so many dependencies that you have to synchronize the work with everyone. And also, the new system must prove itself. It has to handle the load for triple the traffic overnight. Because yes, we've been on onboarding new customers on the new system, and yes, we have been holding the bank accounts on the first system, but it's not proven that it can handle the batches and can handle all the central bank arrivals. So that's a challenge. 
And also, you need to plan contingency. What happens if that doesn't go right? What happens if a direct debit that was done on the first system is being refunded on the other system? Can I really find it back? Do I have the tool to do the reconciliation? Is banking operations, the agents that with the back office, enabled to perform such actions on both systems? So those are, those are things that you need to keep in mind. 60 days before the migration, this is the setup that we, we had. All the clients had a double writing. They would write into one system, the old one that were processing all the payments, and simultaneously write into the new one. Some of it can be done synchronously. Uh, cards, for example, were doing synchronous writes into both systems. Uh, some of it cannot be done synchronously because of uh, the data is just too different, so they themselves had two systems, or because of latency delays, when the latency requirement is so low that you cannot afford an additional I.O. input. And inevitably, if you do this from day minus 16, well, you will have inconsistencies because you haven't migrated five years of historical uh, banking data yet. That's where comes the next part. 30 days before the migration, we backfill the data. We build a worker which iterates through all the payments that were done since the beginning of times, replicate it to the new system, and then make sure it's consistent. This is more than 300 million records, and you go one by one. So the first thing, it will not work from the first try. It will not work from the second try, and you will erase all the data and try over. You'll find records where you didn't know that these fields existed, and you'll find records that you didn't even know you had these customers to begin with. So it's kind of an archaeological experience where you really go through again and again, fix the mistakes. We had 30 days to do it. We've completed it with six hours to spare. Then comes D0. Most, if not all, the data should be in sync. I say most because we run a big reconciliation check where we could just sum all the balances, on the positive balances on one side of the ledger and on the other. What did we found? A thousand and a hundred accounts with a different balance. Well, perfect, I'm out of a job. So what do you do? Well, a software engineer, I just copy the dump of both databases and I do a big ass SQL query where I can find out which accounts have a different uh, balance and then find out which bookings are missing or are duplicated. Well, this query would take 60 hours and I only have six hours. So what do I do? Well, it turned out that uh, we have some very good friends in data engineering, which happens to know a lot about these kind of challenges. They take the dumps, import them in with Spark in their uh, AWS Athena, and well, turns out in the data world, this is a five second query. So thank you very much, uh, data team, uh, all the credit. We find out what's missing, we blame the team. No, I'm, I'm kidding, we don't do that. And then we can finally replicate the last data that was missing, run the reconciliation, and go have a beer, because in Germany, that's what you do after work anyways. So this is it. There is no such thing as a bing bang. This is years of preparation. In a bank, things don't happen overnight. It's not a proof of concept. You have a well old machine that needs a lot of planning, a lot of synchronization. This looks like a big bang, but it's not. Uh, but at the time of the migration, we closed down the legacy system for good. And uh, I guess that we proved that this was, after all, possible. What I take with me and what we all take with us forward is that event sourcing is the perfect architecture for banking, but it is a big upfront investment. You will have to work twice the time, twice the code base but it is worth it. It is worth it because it gives you all the tools you need to have the transparency, the security, all the logging, and the asynchronous parts where you can scale up whatever is needed in the banking operation. If you understand your domains early, you can design your software around that. And if you work with legacy software, you can decouple and break up the monolith where it needs to be done early. If availability is your goal, then you embrace eventual consistency. We had many back and forth debate with the product teams about what could be and what could not be. But at the end of the day, availability and trust in the system is what our customer expects from us. And to achieve that, we embraced it. And use managed services. The cloud has opened so many doors for us. We are 
big users of DynamoDB, SNS, SQS. We couldn't have possibly done that without those managed services. At the same way that Solaris Bank could never be where it is without the monolith that it had first. We are very happy to be here. I hope you all loved something, and thank you for coming.